So let's start. Hello, everybody. Welcome to your next session called Boosting Graphics Performance in 2D Games. The first question I got asked uh, five minutes ago was, uh, is this featuring the new Unity 4.3 built in 2D stuff? And no, it isn't. But uh, before you run away, it's really, really very similar to what you see. And since we're doing performance comparison of stuff, uh, it could be really interesting for you. So don't be scared. So uh, to start, uh, first important thing, so actually me. That's me. Yes, I'm German. Uh, I'm from Bavaria. And I like beer. And I visit the Oktoberfest regularly. And I'm also able to do the, I don't know how you call it, slapping on your feet dances. So, but I won't do this now. But uh, see me on the party after a few beer, then we, you might have a chance to do that. So, uh, but what do I do regularly when I'm not in a beer tent? Um, I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Threeks, based in Germany, uh, located in Hamburg. Um, I graduated last year doing my Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Media. So I'm probably a programmer and engineer at Threx. And the, the topic for my thesis was actually overdraw optimization in 2D games, uh, called a procedure for creating meshes from textures. So there's already the similarity to the Unity stuff. And Three weeks ago, we released our first title on Steam for PC, Mac, and Linux called B-Buddy, Tale of the Guardians. And I was namely responsible for the 2D pipeline tools and stuff. And since it's also involving a lot of audio stuff, come on. Yeah, there it is. I was also responsible for the audio stuff. So to see what B-Buddy is, we see this in a minute. Yeah, come on, Burke. Oh, wrong button. It's just a laser pointer. <laughs> so yeah, that was about me. Next slide is about our company it's called Threeks. So we were founded in 2011 after we won two, uh, no, what was 25,000 euros of prize money from some cool audio event stuff. So we founded our own company in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, that's a team. We have. 8.5 employees, including the dog Tico, but he doesn't really get a paycheck, so he just counts as half. The only job he really does is randomly barking out of nowhere, scaring us to death. What's pretty good after working 10, 12 hours, like, so he makes sure nobody falls asleep while working, work harder. And that's actually our first and only latest title, Beat Buddy, Tale of the Guardians. And as I already said, it was released for PC, Mac, and Linux. And we're currently working, working on a viewport. Go away, laser pointer. And on other console stuff, I wasn't allowed to say. But yeah, it's several others. Thanks, Unity, for the opportunity to do multi-platform stuff. So to, to get you an overview, if you don't know Beat Buddy already, which you shouldn't, uh, here's the trailer.
Awesome, thanks. So uh, that was the fun part. Now let's go to the tricky part. Our roadmap is, okay, try to entertain audience. Mm, I tried my best, I'm a programmer, I'm sorry. Uh, first real topic would be why would be why should we optimize 2D stuff? Like the most people would say it's a 2D game. Why do you have performance issues anyway? It's just 2D. But uh, we'll see this in a moment. Uh, after that, we see what it takes to uh, procedurally create a mesh from a texture, and we need vertices, triangles, UVs for that. Um, after that, I try a live demo, see how we did this in on top of the Unity editor without using 4.3. <laughs> uh, we look at how, how we deal with sprites, texture, atlases, and uh, we did some custom lighting and what mesh combining is good for. Uh, then we actually have com performance comparison and a short summary. So uh, we're making a 2D game now, and we go to our artists and say, make a fancy scene, intro, room, like the one in Beat Buddy, and we get something like this. Okay, I apologize for the screenshot, it's a bit dark. Uh, but it looks fancy at least, but uh, if we turn the scene view a bit, we see, ooh, there's a whole lot of assets involved, really, in that one, and that's probably where it could be difficult to achieve 60 frames with everything and fancy shaders and effects. So when we first started Beat Buddy, there were some 2D tools around, but we were not really satisfied how they handled all the stuff. So I had to do my bachelor stuff and I said, okay, why not take on the task and try to do something on our own? And that's why we uh, made the tools with uh, performance stuff in mind when we created them. Not, uh, okay, I guess also usability, but not as first, first class citizen. I learned that word also. So we see we have a lot of overlapping stuff and uh, to try or to really understand what's going on when render rendering a scene like that is, uh, we have to understand how they get rendered. And when we render opaque, objects like these two. Then we have the yellow one in the front get rendered first and the other one in the back get rendered second. So opaque rendering is from near nearest to screen to farthest away. And the problem is since we have most of the time transparent objects, they get rendered the other way around. So they start at the back for alpha blending doing this one first and this one a second. So, but we have a fancy scene with a lot of stuff. So we have this one and this one and this one. This is called overdraw. So as you can see there, um, we are writing a lot of pixels several times on the screen. So there is something called fill rate. Fill rate is next to overdraw the, the bullshit word no one wants to hear when dealing with 2D. So, but fill rate just says, you, have, you can draw that many pixels per second on the screen, not more. So when we look at overdraw, if we overdraw a lot of stuff, we're wasting a lot of fill rate and wasting performance though. Mm, that's really not a good situation. So why is this? Why are we using transparent stuff anyway? So when we have our regular 2D sprite, we see we have just a rectangular texture with our content in the middle and alpha stuff around it. Like when we actually see the binary view of that, uh, everything that's black is just alpha zero, which would be rendered, but doesn't contribute to the visible picture. And everything that's white is just, that's, that's really the content we want to have. So normally we're doing something like this. That's the, the standard way we're handling 2D stuff in the scene, like it's just a rectangle mapped on with a transparent sprite. So, but we can do better. Having this, like that's what also in Unity 4.3 is, like if we could achieve something like cutting out the content really of the texture with a more close mesh so we could 
just cut away all the alpha stuff. It's not rendered at all. And uh, that would be a good thing to avoid overdraw stuff. So how would we do this? So we got this one crossed out. So now it, it's getting a little bit tacky. So we have to we have to detect the edges of those content we already saw right now. So we have this texture. This was one of the first textures involved in our pre-alpha version, and it was really a good test texture for me when doing all the stuff because when we look at the binary view, it looks like this. Uh, when I first saw this, I, oh my god, how am I supposed to detect an edge around there? There's lots of white snow, and I don't know what to do. Because what we want to have is something like this. So, and this could be our polygon, something like mesh path. And we achieved this by the Unity guys called it looking at the pixels, pixels and uh, it's called image processing. And there are a few fancy algorithms which are really easy to implement if you know what you're doing. Like the first one is erosion. You have this kind of grid, and you move it just around along every pixel on the, on the actual texture. And like here on the screen, if there is any black pixel within this 3x3 three three grid, we make the center pixel black. So when we have a picture like this, and we throw the algorithm in it, we get something like that. So yeah, it just shrinks the image a little bit. So the counterpart is deletion. It just broadens the stuff with something like that. And that's really all we need to, or nearly all we need to process the picture we want to have. The, the last one is just subtraction. We just subtract two binary images from, e from each other. And if we do that, we get something like this. Wow, cool edges, but with a lot of noise. So we have to go on and do some noise reduction. This is called opening. That's just really a combination of erosion and deletion. So the trick is, if erosion shrinks the picture and deletion opens it again. Now, why don't we just shrink it and then open it again to get really the, the first, or to be on the same level again, but with having noise reduced, and we just do that. And this looks way better than the first one. So, and if we do the subtraction again, then we have something like this. Ooh, this looks way much better. So offsetting. What we want to achieve is we want an edge where we can interpret every pixel as, as, a, as a vertex. And if we have all those vertices around, then we can say we have a path. And if this path is connected, we have a polygon, and that's, that would be probably our mesh. Problem is, if we would do this, if we have it right now, we would just cross, cut away half pixels on the edges. So we have to broaden it a bit more. And we do this by another combination of our known algorithms, like we wrote first, delay, delay, and we get that one. So this looks quite nice already. And now we can try to find a path around it to get really a close polygon. We want something like this. Like I just said, we broadened it, and now we want to, to be every pixel a vertex. So now we start with that one, go through, go through, and we really want to have this. The problem is finding a start point, and uh, this, this is, could be a tricky one, but when you look at something like this, we say this is the minimum stuff we want to support. It's like a rectangle, three by three pixels with one missing in the middle. And if we look at that, we can define four start points in every corner. And since we also need a direction, we look at the neighbors of, this, of one of the start pixels. So the one goes up and the one goes to the right. And say we want to go clockwise through the path, so we choose the upper one. And while choosing the upper one, we have our direction. And it's probably true that if, if we have something like that, there is always a bottom left pixel which has his neighbor going into the clockwise direction just above him. And 
since we know this, we can have our start pixel like always the left border one and say our direction is defined through the second point just above it. So if we do that, we have this again. And now we know we have the left one at the bottom, then the next one above. And now we can just walk through our polygon. And that's it. Not really. There are some common pitfalls to that. It's like, what do we do if something like a deadlock happens? Like, yeah. We have to decide, go, do we go left or do we go right? And we end up there and we can't go farther. So we have to check this and code also loop stuff and some alternatives. So if we all handle this, so we have our final edge points defined with that. So there's still one problem that's here. It's, I can't really see it if it's a loop or alternative, but uh, if we go the inner path, say every, on every junction we go, we go right. So we traverse the inner path first. So we get something like this and kick out all those random stuff. So, and then we traverse the outer path and then we get something like this. And that's probably what we want to achieve. So that's really our unique path. We have one starting pixel going through all the pixel, which has just one neighbor. And then uh, if we're through, we, it's, just a, it's just a unique loop we want to have. And now we can say, OK, now every pixel is exactly one vertex. And then we have our polygon. Yeah, in this texture, this polygon would have kind of 2,000, 3,000 vertices for a simple wall texture is quite heavy, I guess. So we must uh, simplify all the stuff. And if we look at that, so the first thing we can do is throw out all the redundant stuff on the on straight lines. So this really significantly reduces all the polygon stuff. But most of the time, it doesn't suffice. So what we want to achieve is if we reduce the polygon as much as we can, we want to have something like this. This is called a convex hull. So to do that, it's really just as simple as we look at, if we look at the triangles here. Oh, that was one too far. Um, we, we look at how, if we, if we kill a point, we add uh, some space to the, the polygon and uh, if we kill all those points by weight, uh, then we have um, a measure to choose which triangle we want to add to, uh, to, the, to the whole polygon. Because the thing is, um, if we just add any random, random space for every triangle in red here, we add, we add transparent pixels actually we, we want to cut off. So we really have to look that we just add those areas triangle areas which are really necessary. And the algorithm we have is pretty slow right now, but all he does is really he walks through all the points again, all the points detecting the, uh, the smallest triangle in the whole polygon. And he just adds this point to a list of removable points. What is good for we will see later. So he does this with the first one, second one, third one. And he, the weight is just, he chooses by weight, and this is just a, the area of the triangle. It's just easier as that. So if we do this, we get something like that. And we see, uh, we, we have all our, our vertices we can kick out, summed up, and we have them in a separate list. So if we want to simplify the polygon, we just go from every, we just kick out the first one and the second one, the, f the third one, the fourth one. And uh, if we do this often enough, we have our convex hull. And that's as easy how we can simplify the polygon. So yes, where is this done? Triangles. OK, triangles is really, OK, let me start again. So we have the vertices to really get a mesh. We need also triangles and UVs. So triangulation is something, fortunately, not really built in into Unity and can be quite tricky. But if you have something like an algorithm, you can do awesome things within the editor, like 
triangulating uh, mesh is always a good stuff to do. So when I was writing my bachelor stuff, I looked at several algorithms and they, they're more or less easy to implement and I stuck with this one. I won't go into great detail because it yeah, can be quite math stuff-like and boring. Uh, but actually, the algorithm is, is pretty, pretty pretty. So uh, if you're interested, uh, just have a look at this book. It's in there, and uh, there's actually a reason I chose that one. So it's it's really nice. It's just a small overview of how the algorithm works. It triangulates monotone uh, monotone pieces of polygons, and a monotone piece is just when you walk from the top point to the lowest point and you don't, if, if you walk the left side and you never walk up then, and you do the right side and you never walk down again, then you have a monotone polygon. That's just the whole trick and uh, there's some, some fancy algorithm to triangulate the stuff if you have it. So most of the cases you don't have this monotone polygon, so we have to uh, partition it into these pieces and triangulate them and that's where you have your triangle stuff done and that's really all I want to say to that is just look at it if you're interested it's a really awesome algorithm oh I'm sorry I forgot that yes uh, this algorithm can triangulate polygons with holes this is yeah this is awesome stuff we, we see when we uh, fire up the editor so we have vertices, triangles, and okay, UVs is, this, this is pretty straightforward. Like we have our own polygons and they, we have our texture and zero is just in the bottom left corner and yeah, we just calculate the UVs on every vertex we have and now we have, we have all the information needed in Unity to create our own mesh. We have the vertices, triangles, UVs, so we just throw that at the, at the mesh component in, in Unity and uh, we are good to go. And now we have created our own, own mesh with all what it takes and uh, yeah, that's pretty awesome. And now we can do awesome stuff. So that was the UVs. Next implementation. So hammer time. I have to switch on. Mm -hmm. So looks great. So we have seen how easy it is in Unity 4.3 now to import as a texture as a sprite. So we don't have these Unity internal cool stuff. So we had to build it on top. But it's also pretty easy. Like, say we have this texture here. Ah, oh, it's our beat buddy. So we can just right click. Okay, okay, it's a Mac with the window, I'm sorry. So, but we can say 2D, create sprite, and then it does me this binary image. And as a, as a first thing, we can filter some alpha stuff around. If we put the slider, then we can see there's also already some noise. We can have the algorithm put this away, but uh, if we see it, if it looks a bit shitty, we can throw it away, like something like that. And we have the opaque slider. We will see what that is good for, but this looks pretty good so far. We don't have to do anything with that. So we create, say yes. We have this, all sprites. Okay, everybody is good. So save, and now he does all the stuff I showed you, and it looks at the pixels, and creates the mesh stuff, and now he's done. And now we have our own unscrutable object, which is the data holder for our sprite, and then he automatically created one instance. i show you what's with the instances. So we had default. The other money creates this, and what we get is that one. And there's our mesh around. And the cool stuff is that uh, we have the points we removed in a separate list. So the stuff we do, can do now is actually, okay, it's cut off a bit just have a slider and vary the precision of our mesh we want to have. 
and we see maybe we don't want to have the convex hull. It, uh, yeah, it's, it adds too many transparent pixels, so we can just go here and adjust the mesh, and yeah, that's pretty. That's really pretty impressive. So Unity does it a bit different. It uh, gives you the mesh, and you cannot change it right now, but. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, it's pretty cool if, because if you have a lot of meshes in the scene, it can make a difference how many vertices you actually have. And you can switch it very easily with something like that. And because since we have the vertices and we can triang triangulate the mesh instantly, uh, we can do everything from script. Like uh, you say, okay, we have platform A and we have a precision of 90, say 150 vertices per, per sprite. Uh, for platform A and we, we okay, platform B is, uh, can do more vertices and we can make 300 out of it. We just make a post process script and say, okay, let's do this with all your meshes and you're good to go and doesn't really, it, it doesn't really affect any visuals in the game and it's, yeah, you have the freedom to do so and it's uh, a quite powerful tool. So, uh, I promise you, what can we do with this opaque stuff? Oh, come here. No? So now we have our mesh. Oh, are you kidding me? Top, yes. No, don't do anything stupid. Okay, so now the first thing we can do is we have our use plain mesh stuff here. So. If we want to do that, we can do this. Uh, but the cool part comes here now. We can say use sub mesh and what it does. It's actually the mesh looks a bit different, uh, but it was it does take the opaque part in the middle and just creates another mesh for it. I show you this in a, when I change the shaders. So by the way, yes, we have a color. Uh, stuff here which uh, modifies the vertex colors. So yeah, <laughs> just wanted to show off a bit we as intelligent as Unity is. So transparent, material color, this one. And opaque material color for this one. So update, do not crash. So yeah. So now if we, I oh, wanted some awesome view. So if we are to change the color of our transparent stuff, we see what actually the use submesh stuff did. Now, we actually, we have two meshes. The transparent part is one mesh, and that's why it is awesome to have a triangulation stuff which triangulates holes, because everything we do is we just make, make two meshes out of this one. One is just filtered away, or which I showed you. Just do the transparent part. And the second part is do the same, but just have opaque pixels on it. And if we have this, uh, if we treat the opaque mesh or the opaque path we have as a whole of the transparent stuff, so we can just triangulate uh, this black stuff here and give this one a transparent shader. And for the other stuff here in the middle, we can say, okay, you, you just have complete opaque pixels. There you go, uh, take your opaque shader. And so we have split off those two. Of course, we get two draw calls for that, but again, you have all the power in your hands. You can do this all per script. If you see, okay, we have too many draw calls, maybe we stick to the single mesh instead of the, the split up mesh. But uh, we will see that using those, uh, those split meshes uh, really incurs a great performance boost. And it's, it's clear, I mean, uh, those, as I showed you, those stuff get rendered from, from front to back and occupy all the pixels first. And we have really, uh, really a low amount of, of transparent stuff getting rendered in the scene. It's really just those outlines of those meshes. And yeah, this can be really performance fun. So uh, how many time is there left? Okay, awesome. So if we are to import another one, we can say, no, create sprite. 
I don't stop here. And put the pig stuff there. So important. Yes. So we have Clef here. Put it default. Yeah. So on, and there's a second. Uh, I may get a bit. Come. Go away. If you have something like this, we cannot split it up because we see there's a hole here uh, and that's where the algorithm cannot do any inside polygon. So, but if you, this, this is a pretty small hole, but if you have a really big hole, then you can save also, if it cuts out the hole, say you have a tire with nothing in it, uh, the algorithm can do something like this and uh, it also saves your fill rate, but you cannot split up the object. So, how do we handle texture atlasing? Unity said that they are doing it automatically right now, uh, which can be a pretty good thing. Uh, we decided to do different. Uh, our artist does something like, I show you an atlas, which our artist did. So that's how we did our atlases because the, we thought if we can detect those sprites from, uh, from a texture, then why don't we just pre-rotate them and, or pre-define the atlas in Photoshop, like putting them in place where we want to have them and pack them really, really tight. And after that, our artist just uh, crops all those signal sprites puts them in Unity and just reassembles the atlas as it is on that because it doesn't really matter if we have some rot rot rotation on those sprites because uh, if we look at, at that one, okay, it's rotated 90 degrees, but uh, it doesn't matter. You can re rotate any stuff because uh, for the algorithm detecting the real content on the, on the sprite, it, it just doesn't matter. He, so if you put the rotated stuff on there, and Photoshop can do this much better than we calculating all those rotated pixels and stuff, um, then we take those sprite and just rotate it a bit so that we have it straight, and it's an extremely powerful tool to pack those atlas as tight as you can, and uh, that's what you cannot do when you do it on the fly. So we really, we achieved to have two or three atlases for every level and uh, the levels are really content rich and it's okay, they are not that small, they are 2000 by 2000 something. Uh, but it's, uh, it's really good to do it like that because this, uh, this version of atlasing really saves you a lot of draw calls. So, now I've prepared the scene. We want to see how the performance actually does. Graphics demo. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in this scene. So this is actually the picture I showed you at the start. This is our scene, and uh, if we collect everything, or if we select anything, everything, so it looks like a spoon. It's really, there's really a lot of meshes and a lot of sprites in there. And yeah, it, it can be quite daunting to do this even for, for good graphic cards. And now I hope I will fire up the profiler and first we do, okay, we start with the rectangle. So now this is really what, what you saw now, just this one click is just really, we have one setting like use rectangles on every sprite. 
and it's just really this one mouse click and it goes through all the stuff in the scene and just uses rectangles instead of those really tight sprite meshes. And this gives us a really good situation to profile all the stuff because we can also do it in play mode. So as you can see, I just put up some sprite settings, rectangle, use the single mesh, use the split mesh, two layers, which we use internally for beat body and three layer split up, which I will show you. And so now we're starting with the rectangle stuff and hit play. Okay, exception, blah, blah. Uh, so here's our profiler. Okay, uh, let's wait until the spikes go away. Okay, that's, that's okay. So we stop the record here. So we see we have about yeah, two milliseconds rendering the scene uh, on the GPU. Okay, I made this a bit smaller. And uh, we have a bit over a millisecond on the on the CPU, so that's really what what you want to to measure when you want to see how how your setup performs on any any machine or any platform. So and we have the rendering stuff here. Like it could be important to have a look at the draw calls also. So our game is is still running, and yeah. we select the second option. Like now we use we want to use single meshes. I wait a bit until the ugly spikes go away. So now if you record again, wow, it's just got just half of it. Now, so we were using two milliseconds just by doing to, uh, using the single meshes, we are now by one millisecond. So, and uh, it's not to say it's really just, this is a really good machine. So if you have a three year old office uh, notebook, those numbers would be quite different. So you can compare this by, I don't know, five, four, six times the difference it, re it really makes. So yeah, that's quite nice, but I think we can do better. So we have stopped it again. Game is still running. So now we want to use those split meshes. He does something. Okay, now he's finished. I'll just wait one more second. Okay, doesn't look shitty. Uh, that's what I hope would not happen. So I I have uh, I have this on the slides again. So but normally you would see a huge decrease of uh, of performance right now. But uh, what it, what it pretty much shows in a good way is that the CPU stuff uh, got a lot of really really slow. So this is we have when when we see. When we have a look at the draw calls here, now we have a lot of more draw calls and we see this overhead happening on the C in the CPU. The GPU should be, it's a bit spiky right now and with this monitor set up right now, but uh, it should be it, sh it should be a lot of faster, but uh, it's really the trade of like, you, you don't gain anything for nothing. Like uh, when we have a decrease on on GPU, we might have an increase on CPU, and it really, you have to figure it out for yourself what, uh, on which side you want to have more performance overhead, and on which side you want to save stuff, but when you look at mobile stuff, they, it's probably it's better to save stuff on the GPU than on the CPU, and uh, because of the style-based rendering stuff, and, you know, but, uh, Again, we have all the power to do so, and it's just one click away that we can test, and yeah, that uh, that's just really powerful. The setup I want to show you at last is uh, the two-layer setup. That's what we use in Unity, uh, in Unity, in for our game Beat Buddy. It's it's a mix of those types. Like we use single meshes in the background because most of the time we have depth of field shader enabled and you, the background is really blurry. So we use a single mesh there and just apply, uh, apply cutout shaders to them. It's just, we could 
render them transparent, but the color shaders is just an opaque shader not rendering transparent pixels based on our cutoff basis. When they are really close to the screen, they might look pretty shitty, but if they are really small in the background and you have depth of field and blurring everything, it's just it's a good idea to do that and you uh, gain some more performance. And we do this in the background to say we have the main layer and everything in the foreground. We use those split meshes, so it's this two-layer combination of stuff. And if we profile then again, we have something like this. This is really what we are doing right now. So we have those uh, decrease again. And what we can see now is we, um, since we have not split meshes in the background, just single meshes, our CPU time goes down again. And that's really a really cool balanced setup right now. But as a last thing, because we are not using any uh, draw call batching right now, because I don't know the number really, but if you're using meshes which have a quite amount of vertices, dynamic batching just fails. The, the stuff we have in here, it's just really, it shares as much material as it can, but uh, from a certain amount of vertices, Unity just won't dynamic batch your sprites. So uh, we just left it out completely because it has some, ha, the, enabling the dynamic batching has some performance overhead if, if, you, if, if it actually batches stuff or not. So we tried and then uh, it behaves different on different platforms and you cannot really rely on it. So uh, we thought, okay, we disable it for everything and see how we, we can get around. And to reduce draw calls again, we looked at combining just some meshes. And again, we do this for the background. And it was just an easy process. So when we post-process those graphic stuff, again, in the scene, waiting, waiting, back on again. So, and this is actually now what, what's really in BeatBuddy. So what happened is the, the GPU stuff nearly stayed the same. So it's really, because it, there's really f the same amount of geometry really in the scene. But as we are reduce, reducing uh, draw calls again, the CPU time got reduced significantly. So now when this is our final result and we look at the numbers, then we have a win-win situation here. Like uh, we have two milliseconds on the GPU and one point, uh, or we have 2.7 milliseconds on the GPU and 1.5 uh, milliseconds on the CPU. And when we look at here, we have 0 0.3 milliseconds. Okay, let's add one for the opaque, uh, for the transparent stuff. 0 0.4 milliseconds and 0 0.6 milliseconds on the CPU. And I guess this shows it really good how this mesh juggling and enabling stuff really can boost your, your graphics performance. And this is pretty much true for, for every platform you have. And uh, having such powerful tools, and Unity does at least uh, the part automatically until here. And that's really, you get over the half of the performance out of it. Uh, it's so powerful that we couldn't have shipped the, our beat body with it because it's really, what this does on lower end machines is it really it runs really smoothly and uh, on 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 good machines you have you have you have you can use the the time you save like for for fancy post effects and stuff like that so we have a really great depth of field uh, shader on those stuff which is built in into unity it was really easy to do and it looks like just amazing but we can just do that because we save so much time on the ordinary rendering so I guess uh, that's it for the live demo right now. So we, we are still running and yeah, now we quit. And that's probably how the last setup is. Like if we click on something in the background, like scroll, 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 our background wall. Okay, I leave that out there. Too many transparent lighting stuff thing. I won't grab it now with the with the touchpad. 
So, don't save. No. No. Uh, I have to find my slide again. <laughs> ah, oh no. Oh, okay. <laughs> down, 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 down. Yes. Awesome. I did it. So yeah, we have looked at the UVs for Angel implementation, hammer time and deadness. So what I didn't show you was the custom light maps, uh, but since we're running out of time, I say we leave this out, but uh, just since we, the idea behind those custom light maps is just really, we have a second texture in screen space. Like our artists wanted to add lighting without having any light, so we just wanted to paint light and all stuff. So all we did is we made a screenshot tool, like artists can go and make a screenshot. Then we made a plugin for Photoshop. It already opens, it saves the, the screenshot, adds it as a background layer, adds a gray layer on top of that, and adds a draw layer on top of that, and the artist just paints his lighting on that, saves it, and saves it as a kind of light map. I don't really know the real word for it. Then um, it's really, when it's in, in, in screen space, it just maps this in a second UV set and adds it as a second texture. So this is really extremely cheap way of lighting because you can shrink those textures within Unity to 12, 12K bytes. And this is really, you don't see the performance at all and we, we lighted our whole levels with it and it just looks awesome because you can, have so many different lights and yeah, it's just, that's one cool thing what you can do when you have the power over your meshes and your UVs and you can do a lots of cool things with that. So performance comparison, I guess we could see that in, uh, in Unity itself, but uh, I did this on my desktop machine in the office which don't, doesn't have those ugly spikes so we saw those rectangle stuff. It has four milliseconds on this one and one millisecond on the on the CPU. So this was the reduction by having single meshes. This is probably the reduction when splitting those stuff and using the two-layered approach and using the approach with two layers and mesh combining. So that's what you get when you use tight meshes instead of rectangles. That was the performance, sorry. Okay, so to sum this all up, what did we do? So we use sprite meshes that match the texture content. That's what Unity 4.3 will do for you as well. So it saves those fill rate stuff and reduces overdraw, those fancy 2D words. Uh, Consider that you prefer opaque stuff rendering over transparent because we saw the performance benefit. Split meshes if possible and consider using cutout shaders on the background where you won't see any difference because of those, those pixels are so far away and so small on the screen, you won't notice any cutout and that it's not really slightly transparent on the outer edge. Combine meshes where it makes sense because combining is kind of like a two-sided sword because if you combine too much, it doesn't get really camera cut and you have so much extra geometry which you actually don't see and it pumps up your memory consumption. So it's really, we do this only in the background for, for really tight stuff which is lo located really close together. And uh, if we can, we, I guess we save 
or I guess we combine in we combine five five to eight objects in one mesh and uh, this suffices to reduce the draw call count as we wanted and there's really no if you would combine all it would backfire like with okay you have no draw calls but you're rendering nearly the whole scene for nothing and you just see those tiny bits and yeah and uh, what I didn't show you but what's also cool is like having those cheap playing around with lighting stuff just using tiny 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 textures and what's really the most powerful stuff is it, that it is adjustable, that you have the power at your fingertips. Like, just having this one solution, like, yeah, you have the single mesh and you cannot change it really, and it, it behaves not as you want, then you cannot change it, and so you won't be happy really with it. But being able to play around with, just like we did with the live demo, just do yourself five buttons and look at the profiler while the game is running and see how the performance really behaves, and. Uh, so that's really, we did this for BeatBuddy just one week before release and this was, this was enough because we knew uh, we're building with all those sprites, we can adjust them. We didn't really performance test the graphics performance because we know we have everything we need, we can change that and we can really look at it if every content is in and then we took, the, we, we took this procedure which fits, fits best then. This really worked for us and uh, I'm really looking forward for Unity implementing also this opaque stuff because uh, we see what it, uh, what it can do for your performance and speed up your 2D stuff and you can throw your content at it and make really awesome looking 2D games uh, and also on mobile because the number, we reduced the, uh, the performance by times of eight for, for this one. Like we started at four milliseconds and ended up by 0 0.5 milliseconds. And if you're doing this on a mobile, you can multiply this by four easily. Because when I, when I did my bachelor thesis, uh, I guess we saved 16 times the performance. And this is, with this setup, I guess it's 32 times the performance, but I don't guarantee it. So optimize your, optimize your workflow using editor scripting because that's what we all did. We, that's what I recommend for, for every stuff, like if you, especially if you're doing exotic things like 2D, not, okay, not anymore, but uh, uh, until now is really the best you can do. See what tools you need and build them on your own if you have some time. And yes, be a performance ninja. Hi -ya. Yeah, I think that sums it all up. Thanks for your attention. And I think we have a few minutes left for Q&A. I just have a question about um, all the performance metrics that you showed us. I, I was wondering if you could give us some context as to the complexity of the scene, maybe number of objects or number of quads that you had originally. Um, just stop by after this. I fire up the Unity again and we look at the stats. Okay. But, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was curious, um, I noticed through your video that you had some sprite animation, uh, kind of like switching sprites I'm guessing back and forth. I was curious, do you make a new mesh for each frame or do you like change the, the like a single mesh? Match. Yeah, I, actually, I omit that that we don't have any sprite animations in there oh. because uh, those were really rigged, rigged uh, Maya animations we used because we started with sprite animations, but it was it's just faked animation. Okay. But uh, yes, probably I would use uh, those meshes. But you you might take a closer look at how many vertices you really use because uh, quick exchanges of meshes can. Uh, influence performance, of course, differently than having no static stuff laying around and not moving at all and not exchanging meshes here. Thanks. You're welcome. So, one last question. No? No one? I have a beat buddy plushie. No? Okay, then thank you.